ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this post-presidential election uh, debate here at NUPI uh, this afternoon. The Russian presidential elections are, are over. Uh, before the elections, uh, the figures 70-70 were circulated. 70% uh, support for Putin and 70% turnout. And as you know, um, Putin uh, achieved the first target. He ended up with um, seven, winning 76% of the popular vote. Uh, as for turnout, uh, he didn't quite uh, reach the goal, but I think uh, with 67% turnout in an election where everyone knew who was going to win, it's quite impressive uh, after all. But now um, the elections are over uh, and it's time to look forward. Uh, what can we expect from Putin's fourth presidential term? What is Putin's agenda? And what will be the main challenges he, he, he will face during his fourth term? To discuss this, we have gathered a group of prominent Russia experts. Um, they will all uh, initially have five minutes to respond to these questions and, and, uh, from uh, the perspective of their own areas of expertise and then we'll move on to a moderated discussion and questions from the audience and uh, we plan to, to wrap up the discussion by four, four o'clock um, I should also like to welcome our online audience this debate is going to be streamed live via Nupis YouTube channel but um, you have not come here to listen to me, so I would like to proceed to, to the panel and our experts. And we will proceed in the somewhat random order that people were listed in the program. So we'll start with our very own Julie Willemsen, who is a senior researcher here at NUPI. Thank you. <clears throat> this is working, right? Yeah. So I will, I will proceed from the perception that we can only uh, say something, if we can say something about the future, on the basis of what we already have experienced. Uh, so what can we expect uh, from Putin and will he be able to reinvent himself, what was the question. Uh, now, I would argue that despite certain goals being very constant since Putin came to power, they be strengthen the state order and stability, unity in Russia. He has been very uh, able to reinvent himself. I think that is actually one of the core qualities of the Putin regime. Today we often talk as if, you know, he's anti-Western, authoritarian, and he's always been like that. I, I don't think so. I think he has been flexible uh, ideologically for these purposes, to create the strong state, to create order, stability and unity in Russia. And by now, uh, I think he is ideologically flexible, probably just to be able to stay on top. So we have seen this fairly clearly from, from the beginning of his, his rule. First of all, in his relation to uh, when he first came in, in relation to the Russian Duma, where he very carefully catered for how the communists and the nationalists spoke in the Duma, to be able to co-opt it and make it into uh, what we today call the loyal opposition. Then we have seen him engage actually quite pro-Western uh, ideas in the beginning of his, uh, in the beginning of the 2000s, basically in order to make Russia strong again and to have a, an economic uh, coalition with the West in order to reach that goal. And then we have seen Putin speak like a nationalist and engage like a nationalist, nationalist to co-opt the potential opposition inside Russia very clearly in connection with the annexation of uh, Crimea. Um, I think he still has this quality and that is of course because we tend to talk purely about Putin but this is not any longer just about Putin. It's a whole system which manages uh, this. But the problem will be that the space for maneuver to reinvent himself has become uh, more narrow than it was at the beginning of his regime. Because, simply because, I mean, he's been there so long. So I think he is dependent on certain core groups. It's a fact uh, that the hawks have become very uh, strong within the Putin regime. 
So how flexible is he actually to move away from that? Uh, um, the discourse which they uh, and the actions which they uh, undertake. Then secondly, you can say he can tune up and down the anti-Western rhetoric, but at the same time, the way he has engaged uh, conservative, traditional uh, uh, values uh, over the past couple of years, I think it will be, it, it will limit him. He cannot turn around on that. Um, it will make it more difficult to reinvent himself. And then thirdly, I'm thinking of just specific people who's, who is very dependent on, in particular, Ramsan Kadyrov, who is the person who kind of holds the grip for the Russian state on Chechnya. I think this is a relation uh, which um, he is now dependent upon, keeping this person there. But it does not give him a lot of space uh, for maneuver, and it's, it's becoming a liability uh, for Putin. So he still has a core asset, I think, in the popularity uh, and legitimacy he has in large parts of the uh, Russian population. So his reinvention in the next couple of years will uh, be adjusted to whatever caters to this popularity. So if I were to predict something, I would actually go and look at his last speeches before the election. He held a speech, I think it's two weeks ago now, <coughs> where he spoke for about two-thirds of the, uh, the time he had about social economic problems. He spoke of poverty in Russia, health problems, um, and why does he do that? It's because he knows very well that if there is going to be a challenge to the regime, it is basically going to come from somebody who manages to articulate these problems in the population if the economic crisis is to deteriorate. So he, he co-opts uh, uh, these cases and promises then, for example, poverty will be reduced by, six, uh, by uh, half in the next six years, which is probably fairly realistic, but I still think he uh, will try to deliver on what he perceives will be a potential cha challenge and what's moving in the Russian population. And then the other one-third of that speech um, was devoted to um, uh, to portraying Russia uh, as a strong power that can withstand the threat from, um, from the USA, showing off his nuclear weapons and so on. So I think that indicates that he will <laughs> continue uh, to project himself, to project this kind of identity uh, and to relate that ability to be a strong power to his regime. And that will have implications for what kind of policy that we will see coming out of the Kremlin. But that also shows very clearly uh, the dilemma that he's going to be facing, because how do you match those two promises? One, uh, delivering on the socioeconomic needs of the Russian uh, population. Two, cater to the needs of the hawks and continue um, spending a lot of money on def defense and prioritizing the security agenda. Then there was a question, um, who comes next, which is kind of uh, <laughs> the question I actually don't like uh, to answer because it, we, we start looking for specific people within the Putin regime. I really don't think it's, it's very helpful, but I would like to say two things. Firstly, I don't think there is going to be a popular uh, revolution in Russia. Uh, one, simply because uh, many of the values uh, um, connected, you know, democracy, human rights, this, this agenda, uh, and particularly in the what is by now is called the Western style fashion, is actually quite discredited in Russia. Second, I think on Ukraine, even though uh, Russian, uh, the regime's policies in Ukraine might not uh, continue to be popular, I think the fact that there was a revolution in Ukraine and that this country today is in such a crisis actually demotivates uh, the Russian population from revolution. And then thirdly, of course, that Putin's strategy of cooptation and control is uh, going to be continued and it works pretty effectively. So the next president uh, will probably come from within the regime. I think not necessarily in terms of a person, but in terms of a theme. So you will continue to have this kind of um, competition between 
hawks and reformists. I don't think hawks and westernizers, but more hawks and uh, economic uh, reformists. And how uh, and who who is going to be uh, uh, represented? Which theme is going to be represented? Will be dependent on developments inside Russia, but I think also how the outside relates to Russia. So if we have an escalation in the conflict with the West, I think we, we might fear that we get an even more hawkish precedent uh, in Russia. Or the conflict can become so costly that you need to put another more uh, Medvedev-like figure in who will argue that we need uh, detente. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. Um, I I agree with you that uh, the scope for reinvention is probably getting more and more narrow. You can only reinvent yourself probably so many times. Uh, as for the succession question, I guess we will come back to that uh, and many, many other of the, the topics you were, you were raising here. But we will now move on to, to Stephen Norris, who is a professor of history at Miami University. And if you think Miami University is located in Florida, you are wrong. Uh, it's located in Oxford. And if you think it, Oxford is uh, located in Britain, you're also wrong, because this is Oxford, Ohio. <laughs> I'm sure I will a answer or face questions about that conundrum afterwards. But yes, it's in, it's in Ohio. Uh, so thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to be part of this, this panel. And I, I suppose I'm an outlier, not just because I'm from America, but also because I'm a historian. And my area of specialty is on uh, propaganda and nationhood and visual culture, and even more specifically films. I've written a book about popular cinema in the Putin era, and it's from those perspectives that I'll, that I'll take my comments today. And the, the overall theme that I want to stress is that I see in cultural policy and in cinematic policy a difference between what I would call Putin 1 or 1.0 and Putin 2 or 2.0. And this is the 2.0 or 1.0 is borrowing from Maria Lipman's analysis. And, uh, the main difference between the two is to build on the theme Yulia began, a, a narrowing of patriotic culture uh, and the narrowing of possibilities within patriotic culture. So one way of looking at this is to look beyond Putin and the Kremlin to uh, the, ministry, the minister of culture and the, his, uh, his underlings. And there's a great difference between the minister of culture under Putin 1.0, this is Putin 1.0 is from 2000 to 2008 or 2012, if we include the Medvedev era in it. Uh, and the minister of culture, the, the dominant minister of culture in this era was Mikhail Shvidkoy, who oversaw a policy called the Culture of Russia, a five-year program dedicated, uh, using a French model or a German model, of ensuring that uh, federal money went to support the arts, movies, books, art exhibits, with aside from the fact that there was federal money and funding, no strings attached. In other words, there, there wasn't meddling in the form of the cultural minister into what could be filmed or written or exhibited. And th things shifted quite dramatically in 2012 when Vladimir Medinsky, who is currently the Minister of Culture, was appointed by Putin and oversaw a much more um, interventionist policy into Russian popular culture. And the main difference, as I see it in the, the two eras, is one where under Shvidkoy and under the first Putin era from 2000 to 2008, where we witness, especially in cinema, but in other avenues as well, the breaking of Soviet era taboos, the exploration of topics, especially historical topics that had formerly been impermissible, and doing so in quite interesting, innovative, and sometimes nuanced ways. So investigations into World War II, investigations of the nature of patriotism itself, investigations into the nature of orthodoxy and faith, et cetera, et cetera. You name the historical era, you can find a movie about it and a movie that did some interesting things. Uh, compared to the Medinsky era where we see the reintroduction, uh, although not explicit, of new taboos. Um, so some of, the, some of the evidence to fill that in. So Medinsky himself is a, is, has a PhD in history, authored, which he plagiarized, by the way, um, has authored books called uh, Myths About Russia and sees himself as, as a defender of Western myths about Russia and a way to prevent myths from re-entering or recirculating within Russian culture. Um, among the things he's done, in, in May 2012 when he was appointed, he initiated a crackdown on the artistic scandals that were, as he saw it, plaguing the art world, but was particularly invested in and interested in cinema. Um, he became an active interventionist in cultural, the cultural sphere. He reorganized his ministry um, and used funding, unlike his predecessor, Shvidkoy, through a carrot and stick approach. That is, he threatened to withdraw funding and at times did withdraw funding for projects based on the content that they held. 
Um, he also, in October 2012, took part in the creation of a new special ministry within the presidential administration to stress patriotic education and to strengthen, in his own words, the spiritual and normative, more normative values of Russians. And Medinsky, in this, in this new, um, this new in, in, um, institution, decided to target film. Um, he likes film. He constantly weighs in on films. He offers his personal opinions on films. His personal feelings about films often matter in distribution policies and funding policies. Um, he saw film as the basis for new flowers to bloom in Russia, in his own words again. Um, and in particular, uh, saw the cultural ministry as one where instead of being um, an investor, or sorry, instead of being a patron, should be an investor in the patriotic education of young Russians, uh, meant to instill a new normative values and a new mentality. Um, some of the ways he intervened, uh, he, he threatened and successfully threatened to, to, dis to distribute a movie called Order to Forget, which was a joint Chechen-Russian film about the deportation of Chechens in 1944, a movie that one would have expected to be filmed in the first Putin era, that is the 2000-2008, uh, era, but one where Medinsky said it, it falsified history. There were no archival documents that documented the episode traced in the movie, so he withheld federal funding from it and refused to give it a wide distribution. Um, he also did the same for uh, Alexander Mindadze's award-winning film, My Good Hans, which is a film set during the era of the Nazi-Soviet pact, where Russian, well, Soviet and German engineers and industries collaborated on projects. So it was a film about that. The, the Hans in the title was a German who came to the Soviet Union in order to work on a project of building new lenses, um, later comes back as a Wehrmacht officer. Again, Min, or, uh, uh, Medinsky refused to certify it and refused to distribute it because it falsified history. All the while promoting one of his own pet projects, um, a movie called Panfilov's 28, about the heroic defense of Moscow that was exposed to be partly mythic um, but still mostly true, but because of Medinsky's heavy-handed, fairly crude interventions, um, it, was, it, it became something of a scandal. Uh, more recently, Medinsky has meddled in the way that movies are released in Russia, even if he offers certificates for release, changes release dates so that Russian patriotic movies, the ones he favors, the ones he sees as part of this policy of instilling new spiritual values, um, can be opened up without competition so that good Russians will go see it and then won't go see the movie that was expected to be at the box office. Um, last year, he intervened and moved the release date for The Fast and Furious 8, that, that epic, excellent movie that, well, I didn't see, uh, in order to allow First Walk or Space Walk about the 1965, the first walk in space to, to appear because Medinsky personally favored this and thought it was the right sort of patriotic movie. Um, it backfired in the sense that last year, the highest grossing movie in Russia was Fast and Furious 8 and not First Walk. He also pushed back earlier this year the, the great threat that was Paddington 2, um, because he wanted a movie called The Scythian to be aired unopposed to make money. Interestingly, and again, um, part of the pushback, film distributors and, and theater owners pushed back against Medinsky and insisted that Paddington 2 be released um, two days later than it was supposed to be, and it made seven times the amount of money that The Scythian did. Um, he also, among other things, um, has made some of his lectures at Vgeek, the main film school, uh, mandatory, where he talks to young aspiring filmmakers about the necessity of patriotic movies, um, and also regularly, as I said, comments on particular films to watch uh, in social media. So that, that's a backstory that helps explain what has become, I think, um, the basis of Putin 2.0 era culture and patriotic culture more, more specifically. In terms of what next, I mean, I, I, as a historian, we, we hate to uh, forecast, so I'll, I'll, I'll raise that card a little bit, but uh, I'm on a panel about the future, so I'll still talk about it. Um, the pushback against Medinsky, because he has been fairly crude and heavy-handed, and it's been so obvious that his interventions haven't worked, has reached a point where Medinsky is widely considered to be on the way out. Um, Putin is not so happy, apparently, with his interventionist policies, not necessarily unhappy with his stress on patriotic education, but he sees it more as a hindrance than a help. So I think if we're looking at the future, one could say maybe we might see, uh, hopefully even, a uh, return to Putin 1.0, where the investigations of the past and patriotic culture were a lot more nuanced, more interesting. We might, however, see a continuation of Putin 2.0 under another name, whether it's Medinsky or otherwise. Maybe, perhaps, more problematically, more hopefully, we can talk about it if you want, maybe there'll be a Pu Putin 3.0. They, these cycles have tended to exist in eight to 10-year periods, so we're at one of those moments. Perhaps we'll see another... Um, 
introduction of a Putin 3.0 culture? If so, I, I too see it as more of the same in, s in the sense of narrowing. There's a, there's a further narrowing of the permissibility of what can be screened and what's possibly be discussed. Thank you. Thank you. I, I guess Paul will follow up on that, but first we're going to take a detour uh, via economy, which is also an important uh, topic. Uh, I guess that's what you're going to talk about, Una. Una Harkwog, uh, research fellow at the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment. Thank you. Uh, I guess I'm slightly more pessimistic than two previous uh, speeches about the, the future with Putin. Uh, my short answer to the question, what can we expect from Putin's third term, will be more of the same. Um, I believe we will see a regime that continues to develop along a conservative and authoritarian path domestically, and that pursues an assertive and confronting behavior internationally. Uh, this being said, within this general framework, um, I do see some uh, signs of shifts in um, the priorities. Uh, Putin's third presidential term has been characterized by uh, a significant increase in the priority given to defense. And from 2012 to 2016, the share of the federal budget um, devoted to defense uh, increased from uh, 14 to 24 uh, percent. The mobilization of the armed forces came at the cost of, uh, um, among other expenditures on health services and education, which uh, stayed at the 2012 and 2008 level, respectively. And it also came at the cost, part, at least partly at the cost of one of the other of Putin's uh, electoral promises, that was uh, the increase in wages in the public sector. Uh, Putin's popularity um, uh, has, uh, ha has uh, mainly relied on his um, ability to provide improvement in the living standard for the Russian population. And in his third presidential term, not only have we seen that the welfare state is under pressure, but we'll all in 2017, for the fourth year in a row, uh, the Russian population also saw a decrease in their real income. Um, although the modernization of the armed forces and put in uh, foreign policy, policy moves have been quite popular with the Russian population, what we see from, from opinion polls is that uh, what uh, concerns the Russian population the most is not uh, any foreign policy threats, and be it the NATO or the United States or someone else, uh, what most people are concerned about is their own economic situation. And um, it follows from this that uh, Putin's um, heavily privatization of the defense sector has been quite a risky uh, business. And if we look at uh, what we know about uh, the spending plan from for the budget up till 2020 and from Putin's State of the Nation address on the 1st of March, uh, there seems to be a shift in this uh, in the upcoming presidential period from from spending on defense towards more spending on health, education, and infrastructure. Uh, the problem for Mr. Putin is that uh, he really has a very limited uh, big room. Two years with recession has um, left Russia with empty an empty reserve fund, and also most of the big budget posts that can be cut, including defense spending, has already been cut. The defense budget was cut by 28% in 2017. Um, uh, furthermore, the, the budgetary wiggle room doesn't seem to be improving anytime soon. Um, the Russian economy shows signs of stagnation across all sectors. Uh, the long-term economic forecast for the Russian economy is only um, an annual growth of 1.5%. That is the same level as uh, what is expected for the United States, and it's below the expectation for the Eurozone. Um, and what we know is that the Russian economy is, is less developed than those areas, which means that they would actually need higher uh, economic growth uh, to improve living standards. Uh, the Russian government, they... Ex um, um, they estimate that the Russian economy need to grow at least at the expected world average, that is an annual growth of 3.5% in the uh, upcoming uh, decade in order um, to reach the, the living standard goals. Um, th the problem for Putin is that it's not going to be easy to achieve. Uh, there doesn't seem to be much spare capacity that can be put in uh, to use in order to boost the economy. Uh, unemployment rates are stable at five and a half percent and been for many years and there's also the capacity utilization in manufacturing uh, is currently at the level same level as during the previous peaks so uh, mr putin basically has two options for his fourth presidential term um, he can either increase the budget deficit and 
stay, stay still and hope that the oil prices will start to rise again. Uh, or he can take on economic reforms in order to increase productivity. Um, do I think that Mr. Putin will be able to reinvent himself into a reformer in his fourth period? Uh, no, I don't. Um, the question of economic reform has been on the political agenda in Russia at least since 2008. Um, and it, it, there seems to be a very limited willingness even to take on the less controversial and riskier parts of the reform, such as increasing the pension age or uh, changing the tax system. Um, maybe he is going to try it in the beginning of uh, the next uh, presidential term. Uh, but I think that the more significant uh, economic reforms are probably out of the question, since they are considered to be too risky to the stability of the regime. We all know that Mr. Putin is, um, um, he, he likes to read history, and I'm quite sure that he keeps uh, in mind the experience of uh, Mikhail Gorbachev in the 1980s, when uh, the attempts to reform the Soviet economy not only resulted in, the, um, or led to, to the beginning of the collapse of the Soviet Union, but also made Mr. Gorbachev the least popular man in Russia. Thank you very much, Una. Uh, I hope we we'll can, can, can come back to economic reform and the prospects for the Russian economy during the, the discussion. But now uh, the floor is uh, Gary Flickus, uh, and you will speak about the, uh, the opposition, I understand. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Um, yes, I, I have, will speak a bit about the elections first and also some of the general trends that we've seen in the so-called non-systemic opposition. That is that part of the opposition which is not re represented in the legislature and that has been mobilizing since the protest in 2011 and 2012. Uh, first of all, I think about the elections. Um, this is probably the most uh, supervised or surveilled elections ever in, in, in post-Soviet Russia, and I think we need to take that into account. Uh, the exile paper Medusa stated that there were some 275,000 MVD officers, 81,500 Rosgvardia personnel, and also 21,000 guards from private security companies, uh, sort of guarding um, uh, against uh, popular unrest during these elections. And basically, that is kind of a, a signal for those that study election mechanisms in the post-Soviet space, that not only do you see that the, the president actually uh, gets his 76% uh, and also uh, a turnout of close to 70, but there are also lots of, uh, of security personnel out on the streets. Um, secondly, I would say that this is interesting from, from the point of view of regime theory. Uh, a dominant paradigm in the regime theory has been the so-called competitive authoritarian regime. That is a regime that mimics democratic procedures and democratic institutions, allows some level of competition, but the outcome of the elections is already known before it happens. Um, now, maybe we are seeing something new uh, and something is changing also there, that there is even less competition and perhaps more authoritarianism uh, OEC, the OEC made a statement just a couple of hours ago saying that the Russian presidential election were well administered but characterized by restrictions on fundamental freedom and lack of genuine competition. So also that uh, thing, uh, also that part of the competitive authoritarianism that deals with competition is now sort of uh, being scrutinized more in detail by the OSCE. So, um, what happened then to the 2011 and 2012 protests? Uh, at the University of Oslo, um, I have been studying mobilization from a societal perspective. I have seen that um, most collective action has taken place in Moscow in the period between 2012 and up until now, 2018. Uh, that the uh, collective actions that gathered the most uh, support or that there were most people present at were the morning marches uh, dedicated to Boris Nemtsov, who was shot in the back outside of the Kremlin in uh, 2015. Uh, and in general, collective action has never reached more than some 55, uh, 60,000 people. Uh, now, um, in 2017, however, something happened because the very active uh, blogger, uh, Alexei Navalny, who is, has been leading as a major oppositional figure to, to Putin and, and the phenomenon of Putinism as such, 
held at least three large demonstrations. In 2017, uh, he held one in um, March, one in June, and one in October. Now, these we don't actually know how many took part here, because uh, collective action is normally counted by sociologists. Um, they stand and they click the number of people passing through the metal detectors in order to get to the site. But Mr. Navalny just called people out on the street by using social media. Hence, there were no sociologists present, and hence there are no direct numbers of how many people were actually out on the street. So uh, Mr. Navalny has uh, used the social media to get people out. And definitely also he has tried to secure uh, support by, by using the streets as a weapon against uh, Mr. Putin. We know, of course, uh, what happened to, to Mr. Navalny. We know that in, on 25th December 2017, he debated, or debated, he was actually in some kind of a quarrel with the Central Electoral Commission on his registration, and he was not registered. Um, and uh, this, notwithstanding that, he actually got a very favorable statement from the European Court of Human Rights in October saying that uh, you know the all the uh, sort of all the cases against mr navalny were probably in order to silence him as a potential politician in, in the russian context uh, so as he was not registered he again went on the out on the streets and he declared a strike on on 28 january uh, again bringing young people mostly out on the street and and uh, rallying against taking part in or participating in elections. So what's new here? Well, the new thing is that um, you have a daredevil politician that uses social media, uh, that bring young people out on the streets, and that protests against uh, six more years of, of Putinism. When it comes to the future for the non-systemic opposition, however, it seems clear that Mr. Navalny is not a bridge builder. He is not someone who can create uh, broad coalitions within the liberal camp. We have just seen recently uh, that he actually wanted to send uh, 53 observers to Chechnya. And these observers were sent on behalf of another liberal party, Yabloko. And Yabloko had to withdraw its support for sending these observers to Chechnya because they could not guarantee the security of the observers. So that is one uh, story that tells us that Mr. Navalny is sort of, you know, not exactly very cooperative with the other liberally oriented parties. Uh, we also saw that uh, Ms. Sabchak, on election day actually, paid a very spontaneous visit to Mr. Navalny's headquarters, calling for a broader alliance, and, and was rebuked directly by Mr. Navalny and saying that he was not interested whatsoever because they were, and I quote, on different sides of the barricades. So again, uh, Mr. Navalny is probably, uh, you know, listening more to his nationalist instincts uh, that uh, Mr. or Professor Paul Colster will certainly agree with me on that. Short on the future. I think, uh, given the fact that we have seen um, more security people out on the street, uh, we have seen more uh, collective action in 2017, and also given what Una Hakwa talked about, uh, the deprivations in the economy, that we might see more of that. We might see that uh, one of the, the big tasks of, of uh, Mr. Putin will be to direct his attention against domestic politics. And given the repertoire that has been used in elections, there might be elements of coercion that will be more visible. Thank you, Geir. And then, last but not least, Professor Paul Kolster from the University of Oslo. Thank you so much. It seems to be a consensus in the panel that uh, Putin has been exceptionally good at reinventing himself in the past, but also that his uh, scope for maneuver to, to do so in the future is narrowing uh, uh, very rapidly. And I agree with that. And I guess I, I also support Una's. Uh, Una's view that, that it, it's um, it, the chances are getting very bleak uh, at the, as it is now. Uh, so, so also, firstly, the fact that he is changing his profile and his policies so often means that it's very difficult to predict what's going to happen next. Uh, what kind of Putin can we expect in, in the future? Uh, but um, we have so we have to look backwards to see what how has he, he um, appeared in the past and. 
to make a very long uh, story short, we can say that he started out uh, in, when he was in his first period by trying to be everybody's president, uh, by, by appealing to, to all uh, ideological uh, currents in Russian society. And basically, I, I could, uh, we can divide that into three. Uh, the, the liberals, the, Western, uh, the westernizers, uh, and then the uh, Soviet nostalgics, uh, th those who used to, to sympathize with the, the Communist Party, and, but, and also other leftists. And thirdly, the conservatives, uh, who hark back to, to the, the uh, Tsarist era, or, and, and the, the conservatives in, in the countryside, the, perhaps the people with less uh, education and so on. And uh, uh, I, very early in his uh, first period, he, ha he, he engineered an um, ideological compromise uh, by, uh, with these uh, national symbols, where he, he gave once uh, the coat of arms uh, to the uh, um, Tsarists, or the monarchists, uh, and the flag to the uh, Western liberals, uh, and the uh, national anthem to, to the communists. And everybody was happy. And also, the uh, economy was growing, so, so he, he, everything was going fine. Until uh, this, uh, uh, he, he should change, but he had Medvedev uh, as his stand-in president, and when uh, the, uh, it was clear that Medvedev was not going to get the second period as he hoped for, and as all the liberals hoped for, and you got the, all these demonstrations in Moscow and other Russian cities, as uh, Gade was talking about, uh, then uh, Putin realized that he could no longer uh, rely on the support of the liberals. And he, he decided to cut that short, uh, and said, I, I, okay, you won't, don't want me, and I, I, I don't need you. I'm not sure if, he, if that's really true, but that's the conclusion he drew. Uh, and um, so, so when he came back, he had a, a strong authoritarian turn in with uh, um, adoption of a, a number of very harsh uh, uh, new laws, uh, uh, clamping down on, on civil society and on, and on um, uh, civil, uh, citizens' rights and so on. Uh, but uh, he could get along with that. Uh, he, he could uh, um, live with that because he still had the, the support of the, the both the, the leftists and the rightists, so to speak, and also the silent majority, the, the people at large. Um, and, and trying to, to um, since we are here, uh, and <laughs> you, you're trying to cut me short, are you? <laughs> uh, no, we still no, have good. a couple of minutes. Good. Um, so uh, in. Uh, November last year, you had this uh, centenary of the um, October Revolution, uh, which was a kind of awkward for, for uh, Putin because uh, then he had to sort of um, ma make a choice whether or not he should, should endorse that or support that or, or celebrate that or what should he do. And he, the way he's, he did it was to um, make it into a non-event and, and, he, uh, and Medinsky, which um, Stephen was talking about, uh, said that it should be an, an event of a national reconciliation. But the way, way it was framed the, meant that the, the leftists and, and the Soviet metallics regarded it as an attack on themselves. So he has now sort of alienated also the second uh, support group here. And then uh, he is left with the conservatives. And we have to, uh, it, so far, he, of course, he has been able to, to, um, to, to be standing on this one leg. Uh, and, and maybe it's stronger than I uh, assume. But, but um, um, what it, the, the package of conservative laws and regulations which he, he is promoting now includes um, a larger public role for the, the uh, um, Russian Orthodox Church. Um, restrictions on, uh, on uh, uh, the abortion uh, and, and also on, on uh, people's right to, to choose and prom have their own uh, sexual orientations in public at least and also um, the, um, yeah, the, the promotion of the, the uh, Tsarism uh, as a, the sort of uh, the, the new, uh, not, not, not state ideology as such, but, um, um, but the, the some of these, uh, the elements that got into this conservative package can uh, impinge upon the life that the most Russians are uh, uh, organizing for themselves, such as um, th they, pe while people regard themselves, say that they, we, yes, 75% say that we are Orthodox, only 3% go to church, and they don't want uh, the church to, to, to pontificate to them uh, what, how they should organize their lives. 
and I don't didn't like the, when the church wanted to, to introduce a course on uh, the fundamentals of uh, Orthodox culture into school, which was a, a euphemism for uh, a catechism class. And I don't want um, the, the, the new law on uh, which um, the, the uh, criminalized uh, uh, mild v uh, forms of domestic violence and so on. So um, I think he may alienate, uh, he, he will hold on to the conservatives, but he may alienate more and more people in this silent majority. Uh, we, and I, we, we want to have a um, research project on this to look into it, uh, to, to what degree this. So far it's only a hypothesis. He, the, the, um, the support for Putin is still is high and strong, uh, but um, we, uh, we, we can remember from Perestroika and also from 2011-2012 that things could happen very fast and unravel. Mm -hmm. So um, that, uh, if I should be so there, I, I would say that the future is, I'm not uh, predicting that the, the, the Putin regime is falling anytime soon, but it, it, the future is very open. Thank you. Um, things can happen, you said. Um, Already now, uh, during this election campaign, many people were speaking about 2024 as a more interesting uh, election than the, the current one. And uh, I thought maybe we could start up with talking about the big issue here, the succession, succession issue. Uh, Julie was already uh, sharing her thoughts on that, but... Um, Yesterday, uh, Christian Gerd and I, we, we speculated in an, an op-ed in NRK Yttring that the succession issue potentially will have an increasingly paralyzing effect on Russian policymaking during the next term, with infighting between various clans uh, trying to promote their own crown princes uh, uh, into position uh, to become Putin's successor. But, but how, how do you see the 2024 question play out over the next six years. Will Putin step down? Will he change the constitution? If he, if he chooses to, to step down, um, in what fashion? Gaida, would you like to go first? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, we, we, we keep talking about elections, and um, there are certain limitations linked to that word, um, because an election is actually um, a mechanism for electing leaders where the outcome is, is not known. Um, so whether you can actually, you know, you have to use the word elections more as a ritual in the current political system than, than something that is actually competitive in the real sense of the word, and also free in the real sense of the word. Uh, I would perhaps say with Henry Hale uh, that, uh, you know, if you have a patronal system where, where the ultimate arbiter and the ultimate leader sits on the top of the pyramid, uh, Henry Hale would say, well, the big issue of a patronal system is exactly the succession, right? How can you, how can you possibly change a leader that defines the whole system? Um, so you, you would have to stay within constitutional limits uh, can you stay within constitutional limits when you have expanded the presidential period from four to six years and already had, uh, you know, sort of a, a deputy president for one period? Uh, that is the technical question that has to be solved. Uh, so as long as Mr. Putin is then sitting for the ne six, six years, next six years, uh, the competition among the patrons, those that are lower down the, in the pyramid, will naturally, as you say, increase, right? So again, perhaps the only sign that we have in, in terms of, of uh, the succession problem is to watch how these people act in the next uh, two years. But what, what would be your hunch? Will he put in now step down or will he change the constitution? Well, it's impossible to predict, especially about the future. Isn't that what historians say, uh, uh, Stephen? Hey, that's the easy way out. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's not the easy way out. No, I mean, basically, there, and that sort of captures the question, there isn't an easy way out. Uh, because when you when the system is so much defined by Mr. Putin's personality, then every step can easily, you know, transform into a mistake, uh, and that is, you know, that is the the balancing act, both the economic balancing act uh, that we're facing, and also the political balancing act. 
so in terms of reinvention, again, Nikolai Petrov from the Carnegie Institute put this very succinctly. He said, now Mr. Putin has been the major mili military chieftain in, in 2015 and 2014. Uh, what's he going to play next? Uh, well, okay, Crimea, Crimea drove popularity rates up. But he has played that card. So how can he, what is the reinvention? Well, I guess that's a fair question. Well, I assume that your question is premised on the assumption that uh, Putin is just as popular today, uh, in 2024, 20, uh, as he is today. Uh, and let's play along with that. And I, I would then suggest that he will change the constitution and he will step down in the sense that he will prob. My speculation would be that he will go for, for the what you can call the Milosevic Erdogan uh, solution. That he will uh, enhance the the um, authority and the power of another um, uh, office and, and assume that uh, uh, there are diff various ways he, that c c uh, uh, could be done. Uh, and uh, it, it's not really important which one. But then he would, of course, still need a president, which should be uh, under control, and it would be uh, controllable to the, in the sense that it would have a, be a president with more s s uh, symbolic uh, uh, powers. Uh, so, and he could sort of, not necessarily from behind, but from another office, uh, control the politics. But uh, uh, this is only one option, uh, one, one possibility among others, definitely. So Putin as prime minister again, and, and playing the, the Armenian, uh, 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 the same way as the Armenians have done, with, with uh, transferring power from the president to the prime minister. Well, I remember in, in when we were discussing the 2008 uh, problem, uh, they, at that time at least, they thought uh, you could have a, the, the union state with Belarus could be upgraded to a real union, and then Putin could become the, the leader of this uni union state. Uh, and but uh, uh, there are also uh, so, uh, so, so speculations that he could become the leader of the state council, uh, which could be a, a strong uh, uh, um, institution. And, and I'm not, not, I don't. I think he would try to uh, avoid sort of repeat what he has done once, uh, once before. But then people would say, "Okay, we have we, that game. We have seen through." Mm -hmm. uh, so we have tried to try something new. But but. The, yes, indeed, he, he will try to, the, the, or the, the, what I talk about as the collective Putin we, will keep on to, uh, to do whatever they can to hang on uh, uh, to hang on to power. Yes. Yeah. Would someone else like to chip in, Stephen? Sure. I'd just say um, I, I do think the historian's way out is not necessarily a way out here because I, again, if the recent past is guide. Um, you have to remember that the, the Putin and the Putin state still at least pay lip service to democracy and, and elections and the forms of democracy. It's still a hybrid regime in that regard. So changing the constitution could have consequences in the way that it did in 2012, 2011, 2012 in the elections and Putin's announcement at, after the Duma elections in December 2011 when he was going to reassume the president, rerun under a new constitution, helped provoke and fuel some of the biggest protests seen in Russia since the collapse of communism. So there's always that fear playing with the Constitution again um, will provoke even more protests. Uh, and then uh, similarly, um, trying to remain president for life, uh, the, the unscripted or untried method right now uh, is equally, I think, problematic because there is no past to guide you there other than the past of the Soviet past, which eventually led to the collapse of the Soviet system. So I think, as, as we've talked about, as, as options have narrowed, um, I think, I think the next six years will be quite interesting because I don't see the outcome that we could see in 2008. I think there were potentially other outcomes in 2008 with the Medvedev presidency, one being that Medvedev would, would build his own cohort and be able to stay as president and keep Putin out as president. Um, was a possibility, but I think it was even then most of us thought there will be a retankering with the Constitution and Putin would be able to rerun for another two terms and announce that that's his goal, that now the real Constitution has been made finally, it's, it's out from under the Yeltsin era Constitution, but that he will then serve two terms. That's always been the, the strategy he's employed. So what happens next? I mean, I think it's a much, um, it, it's murkier to see actually because of these narrowing of options. Julia. No, I was basically going to s support that view and just throwing in another name and another concept, which is Richard Sakwa's notion of a dual state. And I think we still have that situation uh, with the Putin regime that, yes, you have the admi administrative regime and the authoritarian, 
of authoritarianism and so forth, but you also still have this notion of the constitutional regime and the need to at least uh, pay lip service to the institutions which are, uh, or keep the institution, uh, institutions that are enshrined in the Russian constitution. So I think it will be a problem uh, to change the constitution again. I, st I still to keep, keep the legitimacy of the regime, I think they will, he will still have to operate within what is, uh, what is there. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, Una? I would, I would just like to add to that, that um, um, judging from the Russian media coverage, there is an expectation, uh, at least as of today, that Putin will step down. Uh, there are a lot of speculations um, about his health, but there is also about when uh, they may start uh, to talk about a new successor. Uh, and, um, uh, and that generally su uh, suggests, at least to me, that um, the idea of Russia without Putin is, is uh, in no way a political taboo in Russia as of today. At the same time, I guess you have to wait with pointing to that successor as, as long as possible, because unless you would become a lame duck. But then finally, uh, a remark from Guy before we move on to another topic. Oh, yeah, that was more a, a comment to, to um, the, the prospects of him moving to some kind of a uh, not constitutional institution that you sketched, uh, Paul. Um, so the state council is what's left of, of the governors that were kicked out of the federal chamber or, or the federal, um, the upper chamber in the, in the, in the legislature. As the state council, council is, is not a constitutional institution, so it's a pro forma constitu institution, uh, like many other pro forma institutions. Uh, and so that would be a symbolic figure, clearly. Um, so the questions are whether he would actually be satisfied with that. As for the Eurasian Economic Union after Ukraine, I don't think there is an option there because Ukraine has opted out of that. And, and, and that was a big pet project for Mr. Putin also in 2011, that he was going to resuscitate the economic union, Eurasian Economic Union. And, and, and moving to that, which is not a, you know, a, a, a manifest uh, institution in any way, would, would not be an option, I think. Uh, I thought we might uh, go on to talk a little bit more about the opposition. Yesterday, the seven opposition candidates polled around 23% altogether. Um, is the, do you see a prospect for, for the opposition, either in 2021 in the state Duma elections or the 2024 presidential elections, to, to perform better? Are there signs that there would... Oh, Guy mentioned that Navalny is not uh, uh, best known for his abilities to, to build coalitions, but, but is there a coalition potential here? Uh, will the, do, yeah, do you see a future for the Russian opposition? I can start. I think uh, Guy points to a very <clears throat> important problem for the opposition, and it's the the problem of actually managing to collaborate within the the, the circle of uh, people who could or parties who could have collaborated, I, I think that's been a problem for years. If you look at Yablaka, for example, um, uh, so whether that's a cultural problem or what it is, I, I don't know. But I think you that is going to be uh, um, a big challenge. Uh, it was announced, I think, a couple of days ago that Xenia Sabchak would. Uh, par um, partner with uh, Gudkov and and create a, a, a new party, but uh, but uh, so you know you 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 we constantly have these new attempts, uh, but they don't seem to play out. And I think a, a, a problem here for a figure like Navalny is that he is obviously um, a charismatic figure, somebody who can mobilize socially, but he's done nothing in terms of creating a political program, in terms of moving towards a, a proper political party, and that, of course, is going to be necessary. Uh, that said, um, uh, in the uh, parliamentary elections, for example, uh, we have seen that it is possible to get a larger share of, uh, of the votes. Uh, and I do think a very significant uh, issue here is the control of the, the internet. Uh, because although, of course, you have the, the control of the television stations and many, many people are, have been watching that and that has obviously been core in you know, creating 
uh, Putin's monopoly and his and his power, uh, the internet actually hasn't been shut down. Although there are constant um, discussions whether one one should control it, and that is going to be uh, a mobilizing factor. We have we have seen that and uh, a potential for actually enhancing uh, an opposition in Russia. And, and I guess we also saw a successful uh, example in the local elections in Moscow, where the opposition, Gutkov, uh, namely, uh, did uh, perform quite well. Paul. Well, first, I think it's it's important that when people are in the streets of Moscow and others and cities were asked, uh, uh, yeah, who am I going to vote for? Putin. Why? There's no alternative. Uh, so there are very many people who are not necessarily in, in favor of Putin, but but I don't see any alternative. So, so uh, the, when and if there is a, a, a real sort of challenger uh, appearing, then things could change. Uh, and I, I guess I am, uh, I have a slightly more positive view on Navalny than some of the others here. Uh, I do see him as he, he was trying to be a bridge, uh, bridge builder with the, the nationalist. And he, uh, we could say he is the bridge because he is a nationalist and he is a liberal. Um, and. Uh, uh, s s uh, what am I going to say? Um, I, 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 I th when it comes to this uh, spat with um, uh, Ksenia Sapchak, uh, it's not he, he, she was the one uh, who broke uh, ranks there and and did did not want to go along with his uh, boycott. And I think it would have been more prudent, uh, more smart to, to, to re join or the, the the oppositional forces at that stage for a strong boycott. And 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 she. she she could not uh, um, have any chances of, of making a real impact and uh, uh, um, uh, impressive uh, figure in in that elections. So, so she, she she was the one who split the opposition. And for and but the the ability of the oppositionists to, to, to collaborate among themselves has been very weak uh, all through the 90s and the 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 the, uh, the and, and all the through today. And uh, so I have not very much. Um, uh, hope for for this new party with uh, for uh, Dmitry Gutkov and Ksenia Sobchak either I am afraid, but um, I, I would not blame um, uh, uh, Navalny for the the lack of uh, collaboration in the opposition movement. Okay, um, I think first um, I have to correct uh, Julian one fact uh, that is Navalny's contribution to party building, actually comes up. What Mr. Navalny has actually demonstrated is that, you know, going public with your political ambition is really risky, right? So he tells all the other, this tells all the other contenders that whatever happens after the elections has to be something that comes from the inside of the regime rather than from the outside through public politics, right? Uh, I've been following the Navalny campaign very closely, uh, like Paul, again, I have to, you know, correct myself, perhaps, I have seen, you know, somewhat optimistically also about his abilities to to mobilize people. But keeping statistics on the number of events done to his campaign the last year, you know, in terms of arrests and all kinds of, of things, sort of gives you a very gloomy insight in how the Russian regime actually works. Because uh, there has been numerous uh, arrests of his volunteers, there has been searches of his headquarters, his campaign headquarters, uh, his campaign material has been confiscated, everything has been done from part of the regime to stop that campaign, and they succeeded. Short response from Julia, and then Stephen, and then I'll take a couple of questions from the audience, uh, if there are any, before we move to the next topic. Okay. Uh, just to clarify my point, it was not that he's been able to go public and uh, collect people and all of that. My point was more on the political platform. And I think his case just illustrates how all-powerful Putin has become. Because in the course of this, the, his, uh, his years in power, he has, of course, been able to, to make you know, a, a foreign policy, to create a social policy, to, to set up a program across all issues which you have to address when you want to, to be the leader of Russia. And that is, uh, of course, a huge task. And, and that's what is the problem for this uh, opposition also, because the political program, you know, which addresses not only that the people in power are crooks and thieves and that we have a problem with corruption, but which sets up a program. So what is our, you know, across political issues 
uh, takes a long time to make and, and a long time to, to present uh, to, to the people and, and that has not been possible for him. So that decreases his chances. I would just add that in part because the options are narrowing and in part because the next six years are fairly uncertain, as, as I think most have agreed, um, there are possibilities out there for opposition. And it, it depends on how you see opposition. Uh, and here I'll, I will play the role of historian and remind us we don't have to go too far deep into historical time to see two instances in Russian history in the last 100 years when two authoritarian systems have produced a civil society in spite of themselves that led to massive changes, of course, the empire that collapsed in 1917 and then the Soviet empire that collapsed in 1991, happened be in spite of political alternatives and in the face of, I think, people saying it, it could never collapse because there aren't real political opportunities. So we ought to be reminded of that. And, to, and twice in 100 years, Russians have surprised us. Um, what that means for now, I don't know. I don't think it's going to produce a revolution. However, uh, using Paul's kind of schema of the Russian population, there have been protests based on political and corruption terms that have had, have had some legs to them. There have been protests. There was a massive trucker strike last year in Russia that was covered not very well in America, but that, that was about uh, pensions and, and finances, about the economy. And there have been protests on the right, uh, nationalist protests, nationalist movements, protests uh, using my own evidence against the film Matilda, which was supported by Medinsky, this film about a ballerina, the, the, the lover of Nicholas II before he was czar that produced massive protests in the streets, something like 200,000 people in St. Petersburg protesting on behalf of the Orthodox Church against the blasphemy of this movie, and, and therefore against the decision by Medinsky and the cultural ministry to allow it to be screened. And so there, there are areas for protest, areas for opposition. Those have not yet translated to viable political movements yet, but who knows over the next six years. I think that's a very important reminder, and as Paul said, things can happen. But now we'll take uh, a couple of questions uh, please use the microphone since we are streaming this live. And the first one is Ingrid. And also, please introduce yourself. Yes, uh, Ingrid Oftal, Norwegian Institute for Defense Studies. Uh, one one thing uh, that's very striking and that, that you've all been uh, talking about is is the absence of real debate. And 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 I suppose in in electoral terms or in in terms of the general public, there's there's as a feeling of apathy, and, uh, and it's, it's pretty entrenched. We, we know it by now, it's been there for years. Um, but um, on the other hand, it doesn't seem like um, the elite is ready for real politics either. So um, to, to put it in a, in a fairly tabloid way, um, where will the new politics, if, if we see the emergence of real politics and real public debate um, in Russia, where will it come from? Uh, is, is it the elites that will hold it back or take the first step, or is it the general public? It, you know, it seems apparent that it might come from below, but um, that's my question. Where will so it come from? While you ponder on that, uh, we'll take one more question. Uh, Thank you. You all hear me? Very good. Uh, as a political scientist and also an his a historian, I tend to take a, or rather have a very ambivalent attitude to making political forecasting. Uh, nevertheless, uh, now and then I, uh, I get tempted to do so. I won't do so now. And also you have read my most recent book about the matter, about uh, the developments in Russia, where I've seen that I, uh, I tread very carefully on that uh, issue. But uh, on the other hand, if you think about it, at the end of the day, you could say, what the hell? I mean, nobody will care anyway if you turn out to be wrong in the long run. So anyway, uh, uh, to turn to Gay Flick's uh, analysis, or rather comparison of the uh, big or the main political demonstrations taking place during the past 10 years, uh, first of all, the, one, the ones taking place in the winter of 2011 and 2012, and also the ones, the three ones, uh, the three demonstrations, the huge demonstrations actually, taking place last year, in March, June, and October. Well, in both instances, the initiator was uh, Alexei Navalny. But uh, uh, the way you compare them, you uh, stress the sociological difference, but only to the extent that it was impossible to count the ones that took place last year, while it was uh, uh, fairly good. Uh, information about the uh, many 
huge demonstrations taking place in 2011, 2012. Uh, the main difference, as far as I see it, is more the essence of the <coughs> demonstrations, whereas those in 2011, 2012 were mainly middle-aged, middle-class uh, urban dwellers in Moscow and St. Petersburg, primarily in Moscow. What you saw last year was uh, a, quite a different cohort. Those were the youngsters, uh, students, even, uh, even uh, uh, well, uh, under 20, uh, many of them, workers, um, uh, not only middle class, but uh, working class people, and also the geographic difference, whereas uh, 2012, 20, 2011, 2012 took place mo mostly or o almost exclusively in Moscow and St. Petersburg. Last year you saw a wave starting in Vladivostok through the whole of Russia, through 11 time zones in about 200 different towns and cities. So you had a, a difference in the, in the social composition of the demonstrators and a difference in the geographical scope. So my question to you is, how do you uh, interpret this difference? Is there any trends that you can see? Are there any prospects that these developments might lead to some kind of change? And, it's okay? and in that case, what kind of change? Thank you. So maybe we should start with um, the question to Guy. Um, and then uh, the others, feel, yeah, now we have, yeah, there's Mike. Well, I start with uh, Skagestad's question. When I, I think it is uh, it's highly relevant. Uh, I did not perhaps underline that too much in my first talk. Uh, of course, one, one is the actual quantity of people protesting, but the site is also important, as you underline. And, and if you don't have a quantity of people, then you have to use a different set of tools to analyze the phenomenon. And as you're quite right by saying that, what we have seen is a, a relatively decentralized protest wave. Uh, just looking at the, the, you know, the number of, of the towns that Navalny actually visited in his campaign was 27 towns. And he had headquarters in more than 40 for, or even more than 50 different towns in his campaign. Uh, so again, that tells us that, you know, Vladimir Milov actually said this in Journal of Democracy. He said that if the Democrats are to win the next elections, they have to penetrate the regions. They have to go out into the regions. So again, this is a deliberate strategy by going out to the regions and try to get people to support a candidate that actually does public politics. Uh, Mr. Navalny himself was actually also in Vedomosti AU, the newspaper described as the politician of the year because he had been the only politician actually going public with this message, right? Uh, so again, I would agree with you, this is a new phenomenon. Uh, we need to understand uh, the drivers. Uh, there are young people out, there are even minors. And this is why the regime is also focused on using the schools as some kind of preemptive mechanism for not having people pour out on the streets and so forth. So, uh, but this is also ongoing research, so. Well, uh, I guess if the question had been posed as where will change come from, you can have three different sources, either from the the, uh, the um, Kremlin or from the political elite uh, or from the uh, intelligentsia or from the masses. But if you uh, ask the question where will the new politics come from, then it has to be from, from the intelligentsia. Because the, from the, the uh, inside the regime, you, you won't get any new politics. You can, you can only have new, new faces or, or new uh, ways of, of ruling. And from the masses, you can only... Exp yeah, I mean, we have uh, some... I think it was Steve mentioned that there have been some rather strong um, mobilization in, in, on the grassroots level uh, from uh, truck drivers and against the monetization of um, social benefits and the, the, against the, the blue buckets uh, and a, a number of cases. But the, these are non-political and uh, they are also easier for the regime to accommodate and to, to give in because uh, if they do, it doesn't really uh, uh, threaten th their power. Uh, but uh, the, so the new politics will have to come from those who, who can articulate uh, new politics and, and, and present political demands and we should also keep in mind that there are uh, in the internet and on the Echa Moskvo uh, and in the Nova Gazette, and there are, are uh, uh, venues where people can discuss politics these days. And so, so it has that, that's my, my view on it. 
Catherine, no? Yeah, I agree with Paul that we shouldn't necessarily take an absence of uh, policy changes as an absence of a political debate. There are um, there, there are some questions in Russia that are never debate publicly. Uh, for example, uh, the funding for the strategic weapons. That is just a political taboo. Uh, but there are a lot of uh, other um, uh, topics that uh, there are very um, vivid and um, strong debate on. And if you look at economic policy, for example, uh, the fact that Putin hasn't really been able to reform the economy is not the result of a lack of debate uh, domestically. Um, there is um, uh, quite the opposite. There is a very strong debate in Russia on uh, on uh, the, both the, what type of uh, economic challenges that Russia is fa uh, facing and how they best can be solved. Uh, and Putin takes advice for at least three different group of, group of economics uh, in political questions. It seems to be, when it comes to the economy, it seems to be uh, one of the maybe the few spheres today where uh, he actually um, appreciates uh, to hear different opinions. Um, and, and they... Uh, they span from very liberal economics like uh, former Minister of Finance Alexei Kudrin uh, to uh, statist economics uh, like the Stolipin Group. So I think there is um, that, that upon different opinions are not implemented into different politics doesn't mean there is no different uh, opinion there. But uh, that, that goes to, to my next topic because I wanted us to, 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 to talk a little bit about economy. Uh, and you, you said um, yes. They were, the <laughs> you already referred, um, that um, yes, Kudrin has uh, come up with an elaborate uh, reform program that has been submitted. Uh, Titov has come up with uh, um, a reform program for the Kremlin. And there seems, the, the Kremlin has recognized that there is a need for economic reform. Um, and that, uh, growth rates will be kept at a very, or will remain at a very modest level unless uh, some serious uh, efforts at structural reform are undertaken. Um, but, and this is not only to UNA, but the whole panel, uh, what are the chances now then for these proposals uh, that have come to the Kremlin from various groups, from more conservative and from more liberal groups of uh, economic reform, being transformed into a reform agenda during Putin's fourth term? Okay, I'll start on. Uh, I think the first problem is that um, these, um, uh, these options that you got are quite different. And you can't at the same time be, um, be a liberal economist and a statist economist. So Putin will actually have to choose uh, one strategy to go for and um, in order to get the best results. and. Um, there may be some tendency that they are trying to to pick uh, <laughs> cherry pick a little bit from the most acceptable reforms from all all the sides, which is not uh, necessarily going to lead to a very good uh, outcome. Um, I think the only thing that everyone agrees on is th is the pension age that is it really has to be uh, increased. Um, but wouldn't that be a very unpopular reform, and uh, potentially erode some of Putin's uh, electorate? Obviously, that, that, that's the problem, because there are different... Um, the pension reform is likely to be unpopular with the population. Uh, they don't want to work any longer. Uh, uh, and, and also the tax reform, uh, increasing the income tax, uh, which is currently a flat system, is likely to be very unpopular with the population. Um, however, the, the larger reforms that, uh, that goes more on the um, economic system is uh, going to be very unpopular with the ruling elite. <laughs> so that's also not really an option. Um, and the problem, of course, for Putin is that he is being an uh, autocrat. Uh, he doesn't have a broad coalition with whom he can share the blame for these decisions. So um, they will all uh, point back at him. Yeah, I suppose basically <laughs> the same. But if you were Putin and you had achieved what you have achieved now, and you start, you're at the beginning of a new period, and obviously what uh, could potentially mobilize against Putin would be, you know, the truck drivers' uh, demonstrations or demonstrations that feed on social and economic uh, prob uh, problems. So the biggest achievement would be if he managed to, in this phase, take Russia to, you know, uh, economic diversification, modernization, and so on. But um, so that could very well be his plan. But I think uh, 
the limits, uh, as you pointed to, are uh, the possibilities of doing that, that are fairly restricted, as everybody knows, that the system, I mean, his entire system is, is uh, built on um, uh, corruption I, to a large extent, uh, and this type of dependency on, on certain groups, which will not be uh, very happy to give away their privileges. Think, for example, of the way um, once you have become a kind of middle-level businessman, how your business is co-opted and taken into these larger, um, uh, the, the stronger economic interests in, in Russia. So I don't, and then secondly, uh, the, the foreign policy dimension again. Uh, it, it's, it puts an enormous uh, uh, break on, on, on the possibility of carrying it out. The relation to the West uh, and also the, the current kind of spiral of, uh, uh, what can you call it, militarization of the new um, uh, Russia-West border in Europe. It's, it's going on. <laughs> uh, NATO is allocating, the US in particular is allocating more money to build up bases, troops and so, so on. And uh, Putin has to, to, uh, to prioritize that. You cannot just uh, stop funding this new um, Cold War, or call it whatever you want. So you see stability slash stagnation as the yeah, prospect exactly. for the economy. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone else that want to? Well, uh, often we say that there's a trade-off between guns or butter, uh, and, but here you have either guns or butter or cronies. Uh, so, and I, I think I have seen figures estimate that 40% uh, of the Russian economy is the uh, informal economy. Uh, so if they can sort of, uh, but if, if it should, should reinvigorate the Russian economy, th they have to make that more, uh, to clamp down on, on the corruption uh, and get more of the informal into the, the um, formal economy and uh, get to pay people to pay taxes uh, and so on. But it's, that will sort of undermine the, this, this, uh, the regime as such. So, so the, it's, it's a real, a dilemma and trade-offs here, uh, which of those three will he, he prioritize? Uh, so he can't have his cake and eat it. Uh, so, but I'm not an economist and I, I, I don't know how he's going to solve that. Okay, but maybe then we could move on to, to social affairs before we take a few more questions from the audience. Living standards have been, gone, have been going down and more people are living uh, on incomes under the official poverty line uh, these days. Um, Putin's State of the Nation uh, speech was peppered with promises about change, improved health care, improved education system, etc., etc. Will he de deliver now, once re-elected? And if not, what will be the reaction? Do people still believe more in what they see on state TV than what they see when they open their, the door to their fridge? Um, there was a cartoon by, by Yelkin um, showing um, a man opening his refrigerator and in the refrigerator Mr. Putin sat and he said, your refrigerator is full. <laughs> um, again, you know, that's a cartoon and uh, it's a joke. But if you are to, to look at what Russian researchers are looking at right now, research in the region and so forth, you would see uh, differences, huge differences internally in the Russian Federation among the, f the federal subjects. That there are regions that are relatively bad, badly off economically and there are more privileged regions that receive more of the federal budget because of their strategic industry in those regions and, and so forth. So this is one aspect that we have to look at, you know, how, how evenly uh, the goods are actually distributed in the Russian Federation. Um, and again, I am inclined to to agree with Una Hawkwag about uh, you know the the issue of the collective versus the autocratic leadership. That when you adopt these uh, the the policies, and Mr. Putin has actually adopted policies, I mean high level policies in his speeches and his campaign, from giving all kinds of promises, uh, quite different from what he did in 2011, where he normally you know he circulated some papers uh, stating what the content of the May decrees would actually be. So uh, in terms of you know actual promises, he has really gone high up this time, uh, and and promised you know like what we say as we say. We say green woods in our, in Norwegian, right? Uh, and 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 gold. Uh, but uh, again, the issue of, of delivering and the issue of 
uh, who is actually bearing the responsibility for not fulfilling these promises is, is central. You know? I agree that he has, um, in many ways, he has up to the level uh, on his promises, but at the same time, he has become much more vague, and much less specific. And uh, I think that is the lesson that he learned from the previous uh, round of election, where he, where for him, um, a normally uh, exact on what he wanted to achieve. Uh, this time, it's well, we should increase spending on health, maybe up to four percent of GDP, which is much less concrete than. Uh, we should ensure this and that size of the growth in real wages. Uh, so it made it easier for himself to redefine uh, and change um, and manipulate the data um, on the way, the same way we know from from the last periods with uh, the state armament program, uh, which actually had a quite um, specific goal of increasing the share of modern weaponry to 70% in the armed forces. But convenient for the Russian armed forces, they never uh, specified what they mean about modern weaponry. So <laughs> it can mean basically anything that they wanted to mean. Uh, and so they are uh, achieving uh, uh, their goals. And I think this is the more the tactic of this uh, round. So these are more vague election promises than concrete uh targets for w what has to be reached during the next six years. True, although at the same time it's created the expectation, as Ger said, that, that something will be done, even however vague in these areas, living standards and um, uh, healthcare, things like that. And I think, too, it's, it's worth reminding ourselves that you know, Putin was able to survive the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009, in part by diverting questions to issues of patriotism, which he declared the national idea. Russia's national idea in 2016, and also to re-emphasizing Russia's role um, in his, you know, in the way he sees it, it's, it's destiny on the world stage, geopolitics, in other words, um, which are both costly, um, not just economically costly, but uh, in terms of political capital costly. So it's it's yet another one of these unknowns of what what will happen over the next six years, now that he's re-engaged in the geopolitics and spending more money to do so, but also spending political capital to do so. At the same time, he's making promises about domestic life. Yeah, I think we'll take two more questions from the audience. Uh, please keep it short, because I have also one more topic that I would like to raise. Uh -huh. So, uh, it's the microphone there. Mm. Uh, my name is Luke Odney. I live in Norway because of two little Norwegian Americans. Um, I think Julie mentioned it, but um, the overriding issue, the mandate for Putin is the external threat from the West. Uh, we invaded uh, Libya and started the war in Syria. And in 2012, all this happens in the film industry. Uh, February 2014, we let our neocons go in there and stage a coup. And um, the Russians feel mortally threatened. Now, I was a junior in high school in 1962 for the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I do not remember Khrushchev making explicit nuclear threats even showing Florida being, Miami maybe, being obliterated by nuclear bombs. All of our talking heads in the West are saying, well, he's just electioneering. So uh, one question to the panel is, was this nuclear threat just electioneering? And the other, the other way, your, World War I is one of your subject specialties, Stephen. How much does the current international situation remind you of the run-up to World War I? And then it's the question over there. Thank you. Um, my name is Marius, um, and I was wondering, um, considering the fact that uh, corruption is rampant in Russia, uh, and uh, I think Putin's personal wealth has been estimated to be around $30 billion, if I remember co correctly, don't cite me on that. Um, do you think in that in the run-up to the 2024 election that it is possible that he will be planning some sort of escape route to be able to, especially considering the threat, um, from Navalny uh, recently exposing corruption um, and his, uh, as you said, his uh, possibilities for reinventing himself growing uh, more and more narrow. Um, do you think it's possible that he will be searching for a way to get out safely with all his money and um, somehow then bug out? Okay, so three questions here and uh, if we can make it short so that also I can uh, have my last question. Yeah, uh, it's a good question about World War One. I. I mean, historical analogies are always historical analogies and sometimes overused. I, I, 
there are some ways that the current situation reminds anyone of World War One. That is increasingly bellicose statements by people in the West, people in Russia. At the same time, though, the the, dif the great difference that that can't be overcome is uh, World War One was started by empires and emperors predominantly, um, who were using it as a means to divert attention away from their populations at home. They're very they're diverse, multi-ethnic populations. Here, I'm thinking of Austria-Hungary the German Empire and the Russian Empire, all of which thought that the war would be over very quickly and all of which imagined at the time in, in 1914 that this was a war where the offensive would win the day and everyone would be home by Christmas only to discover that in fact mechanized warfare was was the, the way of the 20th century. So I, I, I don't think the current situation bears an exact analogy to World War I um, in that sense. Uh, I, I guess in the, to answer the other question, if I can just add a, a little bit briefly, um, you know, the investigative journalists uh, Andrei Soldatov and Irina Boragan have said that if Putin was going to get out with his money, he could have done so in 2008. Um, and now he is trapped in that sense because others are beholden to him, that pyramid that was talked about here, and he, can't, he can no longer do so. And that if he tried to do so, the next people on the on the pyramid who benefit from the distribution of Putin's wealth would go after him, blame him for everything, strip everything away from him. He'd be a very easy target in that sense. So in that, in that sense too, he's, he's narrowed the possibilities. We have a few more minutes left. Um, I would like to bring the discussion a bit back home before we end. Uh, bilateral relations with Russia. Um, through the Baric is in custody in Moscow. The Norwegian University Center is uh, in St. Petersburg. It's going to be closed down by the end of the year. A number of Norwegian colleagues have been denied visa to, to Russia. Uh, after years of, during which bilateral relations with Russia uh, were expanded both qualitatively and quantitatively, uh, we have seen since 2014 a, a rapid deterioration of the relations. Are there any hopes? for a reversal of this trend during the next six years? And what should the Norwegian approach be? Okay, so I'll just, I'll start, I'll join those two questions because you didn't get an answer to your question. Uh, I think it's, uh, you know, the, the nuclear threat, is it just uh, electioneering? No, absolutely not. It's part of a spiral we have seen growing since 2014, which includes uh, an increasing number of large military exercises on the Russian side, uh, but also on the Western side, we have a new version of the Anaconda uh, military exercise coming up now in spring in Poland. I read a number saying that we will have 100,000 troops in that uh, exercise. Um, the modernization of the Russian uh, military is a reality. Um, I would say, um, uh, <clears throat> and importantly, as part of this uh, broad uh, spiral <laughs> that the, um, the nuclear weapons have put into play, have been put into play actually long ago. And we should note that, you know, also the U.S. has uh, changed its doctrine for the use of uh, nuclear forces, saying that it will be possible for us, we will develop smaller nuclear weapons, which we can put to use uh, towards a potential cyber threat, for example. So definitely, this is not just electioneering, it's, uh, it's, it's a spiral, uh, a very dangerous spiral. And I think in terms of Norway, uh, we are uh, part of this spiral, we just have to uh, accept it, and most of all through our um, uh, NATO membership. And it's interesting that after 2014, we noted that we would, uh, that, you know, could, could the Northern Europe stay uh, as a kind of de detention zone? Um, and I think by now we have to conclude that, uh, that it's not. And our trouble is, of course, that uh, we have built down <laughs> the Norwegian territorial defense. Uh, so we don't have very much to show for if we need to strengthen it uh, today. And so we, we end up inviting in uh, uh, NATO, inviting in, uh, in um, uh, the United States. And in one sense, it's logical because it's a quick fix to our uh, technological lag also. Um, but at the same time, it has this side effect of making uh, Norway look like not the partner Norway, which Norway in a way has been viewed as from the Rus Russian side for many years, but making Norway into NATO in the north. 
Uh, so I think that whole background needs to be understood to understand why relations have deteriorated to, to such an extent. And uh, um, I think it's, uh, you know, we have a tradition from the Cold War of a policy of deterrence, but coupled with reassurance towards Russia. So I think, and there is a new debate actually going on in Norway now, that we should return to that. But if you look at what has happened uh, from the Norwegian side since, since 2014, it has been more of a focus on deterrence. Uh, so I would just like to stress that I think actually it is quite a serious uh, situation. Okay, did you ask for the mic? Yeah. Well, that were those questions are, you know, they're contemporary questions and they're, they're serious questions. Um, you, it's not to be taken lightly on. Um, I think my, my response to the bilateral relationship will be simply that we are sort of on the receiving end now, that we are receiving the signals and we are interpreting the signals. And um, basically, you know, Norway is a small country situated in the north of Europe with the sea domains that are seven times the size of our our mainland and also with our you know foreign policy idea of being predictable and constructive uh, we have to interpret the signals and i see the signals not as very positive for for the bilateral relationship uh, quite on the contrary i see them as uh, having serious implications for the bilateral relationship um, this goes on, on many levels. It goes on the people-to-people -people relations, and it also goes on the inter interstate level, and also considering the fact that uh, we are a part of a larger alliance and also a part of uh, the European trade community, uh, Norway has to be very realistic in orienting ourselves towards uh, the next period for six years. Uh, in our poll, do you have some final comments? No? No view on the Norwegian approach. Okay, uh, then um, we're also out of time, so that uh, that's, um, we have to wrap up. But thank you very much, everyone, for, for attending this seminar today. And please join me in giving uh, the panelists uh, a big hand. <laughs>